Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to our Tuesday Multimodality Imaging Conference. Uh, we have a, a, a really a fun conference today. Um, I will be discussing for the first 15 minutes, I'm gonna hold myself to 15 minutes. Please get me to step down if I go longer. Um, just about the basics of stress nuclear. And then after that, we're gonna have case presentations by Dr. Mahmoud Rifai, uh, who will be joining us in July, and um, we'll have a great you know, interaction with Dr. Amala and, and myself. So just some quick principles. We're gonna talk a little bit about you know, some you know, principles of MPI, some stress protocols we use, radio tracers, imaging protocols, and a little bit about the diagnostic and prognostic value you get from nuclear cardiology. So all basics, uh, very ripe for questions on the board. So everybody knows the ischemic cascade. cascade. Once you have um, ischemia set in or you know, perfusion abnormality, this is followed then by diastolic dysfunction, systolic dysfunction, EKG changes, and finally the last thing to present is angina. And we use different imaging modalities to be able to image portions of the ischemic cascade. And so, uh, for example, for nuclear imaging, you can see it's a very sensitive technique because it detects the, per the very first uh, uh, abnormality that happens with ischemia, perfusion abnormalities. That's, that's what um, we're looking for. Now, you know, a stress test is simply then, therefore, you need some mechanism to uh, identify the ischemia. And with nuclear, you know, we're looking for flow discrepancy, so we use radio tracers. We need an agent to stress, and I'll show you why we need, you need to perform a stress. But then you eventually have your diagnostic uh, spec or PET, and it can be very helpful to identify disease, quantify, and then estimate prognosis. So why do you need to stress? If you look here at the bottom blue line, this is uh, data from uh, Dr. Gould's very famous slide, you know, really, if, if in the resting condition, you really don't drop flow until you have a very severe lesion around until maybe 90% or greater. Whereas that's not the case. When you stress the patient, you can see flow actually starts decreasing around 50%, and really by 60, 70%, you have a marked decrease in flow. So by stressing someone, we can create flow heterogeneity in regions that have significant stenoses. And then with our radio tracers, we're able to visualize those areas of ischemias. So that's why we need stress testing. And this is just a graphic representation of that. At rest, you can imagine even if you had a stenosis there, flow will generally be preserved. The radio tracer will deposit in proportion to flow, and you'll have, you, you know, you won't, you'll have a homogeneous uh, perfusion picture. Whereas this is not really the case with stress image. Uh, when the stress happens, during stress, the areas that are served by a normal heart get a lot of flow. Uh, you have a lot of deposition, a radio tracer, whereas once you have a significant blockage, you'll have a pressure drop across that stenosis. Flow will be reduced across that stenosis. Less radio tracer will be deposited. And in your qualitative images, you'll be able to see a relative perfusion uh, deficit. Uh, the last principle that you need to know about nuclear cardiology is that all our radio tracers have something called a roll-off phenomenon. That means I wish all our radio tracers could track flow one-to-one. -one. So whatever the flow is, you get radio tracer deposited in the heart in proportion to flow. This is not actually true. This is more of kind of, you know, it starts off great and then kind of just rolls off and, and plateaus. And um, why that's important is because you can imagine that you know, at uh, higher degrees of flow, you may not be able to see the relative perfusion differences between um, 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 uh, uh, different territories. So it can, can reduce your sensitivity theoretically. Now this is just a graph showing you all our different radio tracers and their, uh, their you know, uh, how they track uh, 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 in proportion to flow. And what you'll notice is that our technetium agents really are not that great, you know, thallium agents are better with SPECT. However, we're getting away from thallium because of the high radiation. The PET agents are much, much better. You know, O15 water is the standard, uh, gold standard. We have a newer agent, we'll talk about it, Floridapaz. Uh, it is also very, very good. Rubidium, you can see, is kind of in between the uh, technetium agents and uh, thallium. 
So exercise, very important. You get a lot of useful information. You guys all have done stress tests. You know kind of uh, 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 information you get out of it. But one of the most important information is functional capacity. And just the ability to know how much someone can exercise can predict their risk. And these are two different studies showing you that the worse you can, the, you know, the worse uh, your ability to exercise, the greater the risk patient you are. It's important to note that if you are going to exercise somebody, you've got to get them to 85% peak heart rate. If you don't, you're going to lose sensitivity for your test. And then there are contraindications to somebody who you should not exercise, and this is kind of an eyeball test. It's kind of obvious. The sicker they look, you know, active heart failure, MI, you're not, you're not going to want to stress those patients. Now, in those patients who cannot undergo stress testing for whatever reason, be it, you know, they've got uh, orthopedic issues or, or uh, you know, if they've got EKG changes already present on their EKG, um, then we have pharmacological stress. And these are the four pharmacological agents y'all have used to been seeing, but nowadays, you know, the pharmacological agent that we really prefer because of its ease of use is regadenosine. Uh, this is an agent where you know, within one minute, you reach, achieve peak hyperemia. It's as simple as just squirting, uh, you know, the medicine over 10 seconds, and, uh, you know, within a minute, you're going to uh, achieve peak hyperemia. This is a, what we call an A2A receptor agonist. It has a high affinity, so hopefully, you know, as you know, there's adenosine receptors in other parts of the body. It's going to go specifically to the heart and cause vasodilation and hopefully avoid all the other side effects we used to get with adenosine and dipyridamol. However, as you can see in the graph, there are some common side effects. We still haven't been able to get away from that flushing feeling and sometimes that shortness of breath and chest pressure. Uh, there are some contraindications to its use. Basically, you know, if you have seizures, you don't want to use this drug. You want, it does lower the seizure threshold. You know, you want to use um, adenosine for those patients. And then anybody who's hypotensive or having a heart attack and things like that. Uh, it is an agent. We have a reversal agent for aminophilin. And for those who are quite symptomatic post-stress, you can consider um, uh, uh, reversing the uh, regadenosine with aminophilin. What about caffeine? Common question. You must um, uh, try to refrain from caffeine at least for 12 hours before the stress test. These are patients who had both stress with and without caffeine on board. And you can see if you have caffeine on board, um, you can significantly reduce the sensitivity of the test. It's also important to note that if you have anti-ischemic medicines on board, that these can also reduce the sensitivity of the test. So, you know, if you have a patient who's come into the emergency room, never been diagnosed, these are not patients you want to, uh, you know, uh, and if they're relatively chest pain free, you don't want to be giving them beta blockers and nitroglycerins because you're going to influence your stress test in the morning. Moving on to radio tracers, this, you know, this is again ripe for a lot of questions. Radio tracers here are thallium and technetium. Thallium, as you know, uh, you know, just three to four millicuries. It has a much longer half-life of 73 hours, so the total radiation burden is a lot higher. So we're kind of getting away from this agent. But it, had, it was a lower KEV photon, and image quality used to also be a problem with it. But it was very helpful for viability studies because it had this property of redistribution. Technetium, on the other hand, is a high-energy photon. It's a 140 keV photon, so images are much more clearer, and it has a shorter half-life, so its radiation profile is much better. Uh, but it does not have the redistribution for, uh, this properties that we use for that um, um, uh, viability imaging. And so if you ever do consider viability with technetium agents, you, you know, uh, refer back to our, our previous um, uh, talks on that. You, you, know, you have to kind of use a, a different protocol. Uh, what about the PET radio tracers? Here are the three common agents. You know, the most common one we use in our lab, of course, is rubidium. And the reason is because, you know, rubidium is readily available um, with an on-site generator. And uh, this, just some numbers to remember, is that it has a half-life of 78 seconds. Um, um, now, the other agents, ammonia and water, of course, of, uh, uh, water, are, uh, water is not FDA approved, not done here in the United States. Um, and uh, ammonia is um, uh, done in labs where, you know, you can quickly, um, if you have a, you know, a cyclotron on site and you can quickly inject the patient. 
The new agent that you know, I'd like to just talk about a little bit is uh, the Floridapaz F18 agents. There's a big trial that came out at ASNIC with these agents. This is an uh, agent that will really solve, potentially solve a lot of the problems of the other pet radio tracers. It has a much longer half-life of 110 minutes. If it's an F18 agent, so it has a very short positron range, and that translates into a very high spatial resolution. It is cyclotron produced, but because of that long half-life, you're able to, you know, in time, get it from wherever, get it delivered to your hospital and inject it to patients for um, uh, imaging. Uh, because of its a longer half-life, you're also able then to be able to exercise your patients. So a lot of theoretical advantages of this agent. And in this study that's to be published but was presented at ASNIC, they showed with three different readers that the diagnostic accuracy of uh, these F18 fluoridopaz agents uh, was greater than with uh, technetium SPECT. And these are just some representative images of how you get a much sharper image. So finally, for protocols with SPECT, you know, I think the main thing, there's a lot of protocols. This is pretty much what this slide says. The protocol that we use here at HMH is we kind of follow the stress first um, uh, protocol. And the reason for that is uh, going to be shown to you in the next slides. But the idea is, you know, by getting, doing a stress for only uh, stress first protocol, if those images are normal, you really don't need any rest images and you can save your patient further radiation, you can increase throughput through your lab. So we'll start with stress first imaging. The only patients who we would not consider stress first are those who maybe had a previous myocardial infarction or have already taken caffeine, and in those cases then we'll still try to do the study in one day, but we'll start with a rest first. For those patients who are just too big for SPECT imaging, uh, you know, men greater than 250, women with large best sizes or also uh, heavy weights, we will uh, frequently re refer them to the PET lab just because that technique has built-in attenuation correction and much, with a much higher KV photon, uh, you get much more diagnostic images. And this is data from our own Dr. Chang showing us that if you perform stress-only imaging, your, uh, you know, your prognosis is just as good as a patient who's had stress and rest. So this is really, the, you know, now throughout the country has really led to the adoption of stress-only imaging and because of the significant benefits of saving on ra the rest radiation dose. What about the uh, PET protocols? You can see here it starts uh, off with the rest rubidium images followed by your stress images and then followed by uh, a calcium score. What to note here is you get some anatomical imaging here as well with the calcium score as well as the study can be done in 25 minutes. Uh, PET also has other advantages that we've discussed uh, that you can see on this slide. You have LV function and volumes, you have cal calcium scoring, and you also have flow data. We know from calcium scoring that it can be very helpful when you add it to functional information. And those patients who have no normal perfusion imaging, they all have short, uh, they have all have very good short-term risk but their long-term risk is dictated by the amount of atherosclerotic plaque burden they have. And this is, again, very nice data from Dr. Chang showing you that, that in normal pati patients who have normal SPECT imaging, really their long-term risk is all dictated by the amount of calcium that's present. Similarly, with myocardial blood flow and cardiac PET, this is a technique where you can watch the flow of radio tracer as it goes through the heart and into the myocardium, you can actually quantitate that. And things that are important to know about this is that if you take the relationship of your peak stress flow to your rest flow, this is a, something called your CFR, or coronary flow reserve. And this is actually a measurement of your entire arterial bed, from your epicardial arteries all the way down to your microvasculature. And studies have very nicely shown no matter what um, a kind of software program you're using, if you have a CFR less than two, your risk for mortality and adverse events um, uh, increases. And, and you know, um, so CFR can be of a lot of uh, value, especially when patients with no known CAD. CAD. If you have a CFR greater than um, two, you can, this is a very high negative predictive value uh, 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 for advanced uh, uh, vascular disease. Uh, it can confirm abnormalities in CAD. 
It can predict more severe disease. You may see perfusion defect in your relative images in only one territory, but flow may tell you that other diseases are involved. And then it can also identify non-responders. So flow, flow data really gives you a lot of useful information. When it comes to diagnose, uh, diagnostic accuracy, uh, you know, I won't spend too much time, but a lot of data has been published, and you can see here really the two best tests, um, um, and really is our, uh, you know, the, for looking, for diagnostic uh, stress tests are MRI and PET. They really have the highest diagnostic accuracy, and at least in one study where the uh, patient, 208 patients did CT, SPECT and PET, and they were compared to FFR, PET had, had the highest uh, C statistics. Uh, when it comes to flow data, flow data is also shown to have excellent diagnostic accuracy. If you, again, as we had mentioned, if you have a normal CFR, you have a very low risk of, a, uh, of having high risk CAD. When it comes to risk stratification, we all know that if you're, you have a normal perfusion study, it identifies a cohort of patients that have low risk, and the more abnormal your results are, the worse your prognosis. And this is data from SPECT. Um, in, interestingly, you can even then add in further your information of, in, of ejection fraction to this, and as your injection fraction falls and more perfusion abnormalities you have, the risk just progressively keeps on increasing. Similar data has been shown with PET. Uh, as well, and this is data from uh, Dr. Amalla, who's showing the prognostic value of looking at CFR and perfusion data. And you can see here, no matter what your perfusion uh, values are, the worse your coronary flow, total global coronary flow reserve is, that indicates a higher risk cohort of patients. And this is just the, the largest study that's been published, over 12,000 patients showing you that you know, once the CFR below, dips below two, these are high-risk patients, and then whether you have ischemia or you don't, you can really risk stratify your patients based on their CFR. So this was the first half, and I think I did good. I think I stuck to 15, 17 minutes, and now it's my pleasure to in introduce Dr. Rafai. All right, thank you, Dr. Nabi. So we're gonna illustrate some of the, the concepts that Dr. Nabi explained with some cases. And uh, we're hoping that this is as interactive as possible. So please, I'll ask some questions from the audience, but do chime in, because uh, we want this to be uh, interactive. All right, so I'll start with the uh, first case of an 87-year-old male. History of CAD, that's post-cabbage, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, presented really his main uh, presenting uh, issue was new T-wave inversions in the infralateral leads uh, on his clinic EKGs. He was asymptomatic at the time. And um, the referring physician ordered an MPI, so a SPECT study, uh, for this patient. Um, these are the perfusion images. Does anyone want to? Can you introduce what are each line? Yes, absolutely. So, uh, so this is a stress supine stress prone and the rest supine. So we will compare the rest to the stress images. Um, as this audience very well knows, these are the uh, short axis, axis images, uh, horizontal long axis and the vertical long axis. So we can comment on the different walls and where the perfusion abnormality is. Okay, sorry. All right, so let's try to make this interactive. So we'll pass it from one fellow to another, so. <coughs> First of all, is this SPECT or PET? It's SPECT. Okay, good. So uh, the top line, we have stress supine, then we have stress prone imaging, and followed by rest supine. Um, a, I would say that the images are not aligned very well um, uh, in terms of uh, the slices. However, when I look at them, I see that there is an inferior uh, perfusion defect and uh, the stress supine that stays uh, mid-inferior infraapical perfusion defect uh, with prone imaging that um, mostly completely goes away with rest supine imaging. So uh, an ischemic inferior defect, infraapical and mid-inferior defect. Okay, so you have size, location, 
how how much how you decide this defect? Um, I mean, we can do the calculation uh, based on the stress rest, but uh, just eyeballing it, I would say it's about 10 to 15 percent um, defect. Yeah. So that's a lot, right? Now, in terms of doses, so Dr. Nabi just mentioned the stress protocols we're using here. So obviously, we started with stress first. So is there a difference in dosage that you have between these? Correct. So uh, the rest, um, they will wait 45 minutes, and then they will give uh, triple the dose of um, uh, the dose um, of stress. So yes, so there is a difference. So we have more dose in the rest. OK. So you have the, the nice effect. If you look at the images carefully, you see better edge delineation with the rest images because they're higher dose. Correct. Now, can we always do that? Or also Dr. Nabi just mentioned that. Can we always do it? Or sometimes we have to defer the patient to another day? When do we decide that we can do stress stress on the same day? And when we decide that we're going to go to our next day? It depends on the size of the patient. Like, uh, if the if the patient uh, has, let's say, a bigger size, or it's a smaller patient, um, the total dose, like x plus two x, that they would get at three x, x plus three x, that they would get uh, at rest and at stress. If this hits the maximum dose, they won't be able to get both in the same day. So what Isa was saying is that we start with one dose at stress, and then if we're going to need the rest image, we have to give three times the dose. So it, she said x plus 3x. The maximum dose you're going to give is about 40 to 45 per 45 millicuries. So if your x plus 3x is above, so technically if you gave more than 10 millicuries at rest, you're going to hit your maximum dose if you can require at rest, and then you're going to end up requiring to go to a two-day protocol. Most of our patients are hitting that. That's one of the advantages if you're going to push them to go for a PET scan where you can do both equally at the same dose. OK, so what's your differential here? As in differential, like what is? In terms of like what's the cause of this defect? You need more info or you're sold on this? You know, Dr. Almala, I'm always sold. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Send to the, the patient to the cat lab. <laughs> All right. Show them if you have additional info. So he has a gated data. Would you be? So is it contracting or not? Or would contraction rule out ischemia? That's what I'm trying to allude to. Oh, I understand. Um, so presence of like normal wall motion on SPECT is not going to rule out ischemia because when do we image them after? And we discuss that to every Wednesday. When do we image them after? So you do your injection, wait 45 minutes Correct. if it's 45. a vasodilator stress. So by the time you're imaging them, the wall motion abnormality most likely is gone. If you detect it, then it is more cumbersome. But if you don't detect it, so more likely, wall motion is going to help you on exercise because we omit them earlier rather than later. Yeah. All right, go ahead, Mahmoud. So here's your favorite. Tell us. <laughs> so there's a tight lesion here. So graft yeah, disease, graft, is graft to the PDA and has Tight disease, even in the proximal segment, it's not healthy either. Yeah. OK. Any question about this? All right, go to the next one. All right. This one is a 49-year-old male, history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, stent to the LED, presented with typical chest pain. And so here are the perfusion images. What do you think? So this more looks more aligned than the prior one. I see uh, inferolateral defect on both the stress uh, prone and supine, and that's not as mu as evident 
at rest. It's mostly basal in mid. And you can also see on the other axis too, in the HLA and the VLA. Probably it does inf improve a little bit on prone, but it doesn't completely resolve, right? So, and obviously on this rest, this is rest supine. So ideally, we would love to do rest prone also to compare apples to apples. But since the rest is supine, yeah, you still have some attenuation. But there is clearly much significant difference in terms of in the lateral wall, especially if you look at the HLA images, the first, the third column on the HLA images, you see this defect in the lateral wall, which is very reversible there. So his EF uh, at rest was 71% and at stress was 65%. So there is a 6% drop in EF. And this is, again, 45 minutes after we image. So it is so concerning. That's even more concerning there. Hassan, we're keeping the microphone with you. <laughs> <laughs> So I, 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 I see that, uh, so that's a dominant circumflex. Um, I see there's some mild left main disease, but I don't see, do you have another shot or? No, yeah. So dominant circumflex. Um, left main is okay. LED is fine, mild blacking. Diagonals are fine. I don't see any obstructive critical lesion yet, but I don't see a proximal very well. Uh, I would like to see an LA or caudal shot if you have it. Uh, so Non-dominant right RCA, so as if expected. You go back to the first one, I thought it showed something. Yeah, maybe I'm missing something. Yeah. The prior one, oh, the sorry. one before. you think of this one there? Yeah, maybe there's it does have an occluded O and two yeah. stent. Yeah. This one there is slowing. So maybe we don't have the shot that showed yeah, the Yeah, I best think the iliocardal, maybe there is some osteal circumflex disease that is getting overlapped here, uh, which we don't have the shots. Yeah, so this was called like osteal left main, osteal LAD disease, and the occluded stent in ON2. The osteal left main definitely is diseased, and there's little back flush there. I agree yeah. with that. Yeah. So this might explain the drop in ejection fraction during stress. So again, if you think this is left main, and it's a left dominant system. If you go back to the perfusion images, how come we didn't see ischemia in the LAD? <laughs> because it's relative perfusion. So with spec, even though that left main looked tubular, like moderate or like 50 plus lesion, but we didn't see ischemia in the LED, we only saw it on the circ because the circ is the more ischemic. So with spec imaging, we tend to underestimate the burden of disease. So you can detect multiple patients who have multi-vessel disease we might be able to see them just as single vessel disease simply because there is, like you see, the most significant lesion. While on PET, we have other tricks and tools that will allow us to look at these patients. So you look at ancillary findings in PET, sorry, on SPECT imaging, and these include drop in ejection fraction if it happens, TID, positive EKG changes, and other things. Questions? All right, go next. All right. All right, so uh, perfect segue to the next couple of cases. So this is a 74-year-old male. History of hypertension, diabetes, tongue cancer, remote smoking history. Uh, had an abnormal stress test, uh, exercise stress test, and was referred for PET. So here are the perfusion right. images. Who wants to take this? Let me see which 
Um, sorry, so let me just clarify. You said these were pet images? Yeah. Okay. So this is stress. Stre stress on top. Stress and rest. Yes, of course. <laughs> um, stress on top and rest on bottom. I do see uh, probably moderate to severe defect um, uh, in the inferior wall, extending from the base all the way down to the mid, almost apical, um, that reverses with rest. Size, of, I would say, probably uh, almost five segments. So this would be a large size. Uh huh. So three plus. Uh, well, <laughs> I feel as though the, in the, especially in the basal segments, I'm seeing a complete dropout of that inferior segment. Um, yeah, okay, so, so yeah, if you look in here, it's almost absent. Again, nuclear is not the best to be displayed on non-digital monitors, but yeah, if you look at these here, it's almost absent. So I think it's severe here and then moderate on the other ones, but definitely not mild. Yeah, we you have know, that quantitative because data. Because sometimes depending on, on the software. display, right? Yeah, so there is this quantitative data based on normal databases, and you can tell how much decreased counts on these. Yeah, that's so. something that we don't usually standardize when we call it, right? Because somebody's moderate could be someone else, moderate to severe or severe or absent. Yeah, with PET you have only one bias, so it's standardized within my needs. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, there are databases that will give you how much reduced counts you have in there, and even for SPECT you have that. Now with SPECT the problem is that you don't use it as much because some of the reduced counts may be from attenuation. Correct, correct. So people tend to ignore it because a lot of the decreasing counts are artifacts attenuation. But with PET we give it way more attention. So if your PET is well processed, and the registration is good, then you should interpret any mild reduction. So I mean, within obviously the study quality, I mean, if you have a BMI of 70, you will expect that attenuation has a limit where it works. Mm -hmm. But uh, my point is we do take in PET because we don't say attenuation. So all of you that have seen PET reports, you probably should not see attenuation artifact. If there is attenuation artifact, we should go back and reprocess the study at the machine and calculate it. So here, like, and you're welcome to come look at it. It's almost absent here on the monitor. So in the mid-inferior, sorry, the basal and mid-inferior, it's almost absent count set. So that would put it more in the severe range there. Yeah. So the pet, do you ever say absence of count or? Yeah, okay. I mean it comes as absence of count, but I don't like that word because it's not, so I lump the absence to more into the severe because mm -hmm. it may not translate very well to the referring physicians. But we have 100% compared to the normal databases. Mm -hmm. So the severity of count reduction, is it correlate the same respect with the degree of stenosis? Uh, that, I mean, obviously Faisal just spoke about the roll-off, so I mean ideally on a linear tracer it would, but uh, there should be a good correlation with that. But uh, right now even with the reconstruction algorithms, it would be like, like for example this one I would expect it to re be a really very high grade stenosis. Yeah. So it does correlate, especially that you have a very normal rest perfusion there. All right. So what additional data you got from Pat? Floor reserves. <laughs> additional information? Yeah. What, what do you got? Oh, oh uh, corner flow reserve, please. <laughs> well, 
We, we can start with calcium score. <laughs> oh, right, of course. <laughs> Since Dr. Chang is here. So her, her calcium score was 2,715. Does that make you any suspicious of other stuff? Potential so you have effects. the numbers, I cannot read them, but it's like almost three vessel calcium. Mm -hmm. well, so multi vessel. Equally distributed in all three. Yes, Does this so patient has like advanced CKD or ESRD? No. no. Okay. So now we have ejection fraction. Did you put the numbers? Yeah, so you see here the rest ejection fraction was 58 and went up to 61%. So what do we look for? So we just commented on the ejection fraction response with SPECT. What about PET? In PET, Five you're percent? having more peak, uh, you're taking this, the stress images at peak stress. So <clears throat> we can take the uh, EFs um, difference more to the, to the bank, if you will. So the fact that it went o up only 58 to 61 is uh, near flat response. Yeah. So because yeah. we're imaging them at peak stress, so like in spec, we stress them in the cubicle and so in the PET, we stress them in the cubicle or in the stress room, and then we move image them later. But in PET, where does stress happen? On the table, right? So as we are imaging them, we're stressing them. So ideally, what kind of response you expect with regadenosine? We're using primarily regadenosine. What would happen to the EF in a normal patient? It should go up, and we expect about 5% increase in ejection fraction. So the lack of improvement in ejection fraction is not good, especially with rubidium PET. It's less pronounced with ammonia PET. And what happens with rubidium PET? If you have 5% or less <coughs> or more decrease, so if the ejection fraction drops 5% or more, that's a bad sign and usually suggestive of multivessel disease. Mm -hmm. So here it went up, but didn't go up to 5%, but at least we're not dropping down. Is, was there any TID? Sorry. Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, there is visual TID, I can tell, yeah. Although TID is like from every analysis we're doing with PET, because of all the robustness of data, it falls off. So you don't need, we don't give so much power for that. So now the flow data. What so do you want to do with this? So a normal myocardial flow reserve would be two. Um, I do see at rest, uh, the flows are low. And then at stress, there is some augmentation, but uh, inadequate, especially in the CERC and RCA territory. Uh, what do you think of the regionality of it? So the question is going to come to you. We just showed you that we might miss multivessel disease with SPECT. Do you think this is multivessel disease or this is single vessel disease? Multivessel. Mm. So I, I think it's global uh, MFRs are decreased and regional MFRs are decreased in CERC and RCA. Uh, the LAD did document and the MFR is two. However, I think it's, uh, I think I'm still suspicious that it's gonna be multivessel disease. So you don't trust the regionality. I mean, what bothers me is that the peak stress is not too high, but this patient still doubled his flow. So even if there is a lesion, it would be least severe in the LAD, but way significantly more severe here. And look at this, what Dr. Nabi also just mentioned to you in the lecture before, that normally at rest you have homogeneous flow, even in patients with obstructive disease. And even in the most ischemic segment, what happened is that the flow increased. So we're not inducing ischemia, although we're saying ischemia. We are primarily in in inducing heterogeneity of flow. So the increase in the area where there is perfusion defect was less than the increase in the area that there was no perfusion defect. Okay? So it's, that's why when you call me and say troponin is 100 or so, I tell you, like, okay, we'll go ahead and do it because we're really not much inducing ischemia. It's, that's part of the safety 
of uh, vasodilator stress. So who thinks single vessel disease? Who thinks multi-vessel disease? Single vessel. Single vessel. No takers? Multi-vessel? Wow, everybody is solo in the calcium score. Go defend <laughs> your case. <laughs> say probably non-obstructive disease in dilated. What do you think, Hassan? Yeah, I think it's going to be multi-vessel disease, but I'm going to interpret the angiograms. So uh, you have a very short left main selective injection into the circumflex. You have um, OM1, which has a tight tandem lesions, uh, which is a large bifurcating OM1. And then you have mid circ which has some moderate lesions. And then uh, distal LPLs are angiographically free of significant disease. Uh, the injection of the LAD is not good, so I mean, maybe you have next views with the selective injection, so that's better. So I think you have this moderate, long segment of LAD disease. It's still a magnet fluid twice there. Correct. Um, yeah, and, and it's, it's, it's strictly moderate, and, and in the cath lab, it's strictly... Uh, something that you should IFR or FFR. Uh, in the mid to distal LED, there is a concerning lesion at the bend, um, which is not very opened up in this angiographic view. But yeah, I, I would I would agree with you that it's, it's not a critical stenosis like what we saw in the CERC and the OM, uh, OM especially. But uh, um, LED disease is uh, is moderate diffuse long segment disease, and it's heavily calcified. I can see that. So that's your RCA, uh, mid to distal RCA has a critical narrowing. Um, uh, do you have another shot of the RCA or no? Oh, OK, there. but yeah, I think mid, uh, distal RCA at the level of uh, bifurcation uh, has uh, significant disease. And in the PDA, uh, uh, sorry, in the PLs, you have tandem lesions, critical lesions. Um, so yeah, I think I'm, I'm, I'm Again, if you're going to ask me, is it multivessel disease? I think it is. Uh, I, LED, correct. LED is, uh, I don't know. The correct answer is, in this day and age, we should FFR or IFR this lesion. <laughs> All right, so this is 71-year-old female, history of hypertension, CHF, morbid obesity, and CKD. <clears throat> she presented with worsening shortness of breath and had a mild troponin elevation. This is PETO or this is new, the spec? PET. Nice images. So stress on the rest of it. I can't see from <laughs> Yeah, I have to come. I can't see from there. So stress, rest. OK. Stress. <laughs> so that's hard, actually. <laughs> I don't see any perfusion defect here. That would mean that you're showing in every case with perfusion defect. Yeah, I don't see any. Uh, what's the calcium? So this is a lady, 70 year old, CKD, and so shortness of breath. OK. So I would say I, I don't see any perfusion what defect. What about here. the apex? It, there is, but it doesn't correct with, with the stress. Yeah. The total calcium score is seven, seven sixteen. And most of it in the left main. One seven one forty seven. Yeah, so it's kind of distributed. The RCA also is two sixty six, right? Yeah. I can't see that. Yeah, left main <coughs> one forty seven. LED was three fifty two. 
CERC was 32 and RCA was 205. So it's kind of evenly distributed. This, I would look also at the uh, ejection fraction, if there is any TID also. So EF augmented from 57% to 61%. And here's the apex stress and rest. And the walls are all coming down. I don't see any wall motions. Uh, the apex is nicely contracting. So if it's happening rather than it will be back. All right. OK. Let's see. So the rest flows are low, and the MFR also is on the on the lower so side. So you said the rest flows are low. It should be actually more than one higher than more yeah, than I one mean point five. Usually, point seven to oh, point to seven. one should be fine. So the rest flows are okay. Are okay. When the stress, they should augment double. They didn't double. So yeah, that's what I remember. Correct. Good memory. <laughs> <laughs> so the f my quality flow reserve is low. So yeah, we have like normal resting flow, but <coughs> the stress flow is not too high. It went up to 1.7 though. So what's the differential at this stage? So we have an unsagenal disease patient, mm -hmm. most likely some LVH, normal perfusion, EF augmented. We have normal ejection fraction, I mean normal EKG, and flow went up to 1.7. So what's your differential here? So the flows, so from what I understood, the, the flows went up, but not as, so yeah. it's mild elevation, right? So I would say most likely this is, in the light of that calcium score, I would think it is more of a microvascular disease rather than yeah. epicardial. This is unsagenal disease, and this is what the guidelines say, is that we need more data, because n the reason for it is that not every unsagenal disease patient is going to have reduced flow from obstructive disease. Some of the reduced flow is going to be from microvascular dysfunction from unsagenal disease. So these patients have higher probability of not vasodilating maximally because of that. Okay? So, yeah, but you have calcium score. If the calcium score was higher or usually if there are more data, then I would be more concerned about obstructive disease. But this is a case where we have not completely ruled out obstructive disease, but yeah. I would say that if I'm going to play the probability, the probability is that less likely to be obstructive disease, more likely non-obstructive disease and microvascular dysfunction. But these cases where you have low flow, high calcium score is a tough group and sometimes falls outside our abilities in PET or non-invasive imaging in general to sort it out. So. So, so here it's uh, sort of an uh, LAO shot. Um, basically, we don't see much epicardial disease on this shot. Is there any other shots? There's yeah. some calcium that you can see by, uh, in the beginning. And the RCA does not have any any significant uh, epicardial stenosis. Yeah. So that's why, I mean, we had even a few weeks ago when we were rounding a patient with 6,000 calcium score. Very similar story. And still had non-obstructive disease. So these patients, I mean, if you're going to take everybody with reduced flow, some of them may have obstructive disease, but it is like in the setting of overall, I think this mild reduction in flow is more likely to be related to incisional disease rather than focal obstructive disease. And this is like one of those tough cases with incisional disease specifically. All right. Yes, sir. It's ongoing research. The more you cut these guys, the more you do invasive hemodynamics, the more you help us. 
maybe I'll send them to Dr. Chang. Yeah. We will do CTA on them. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so, but I mean, I, at least for PET flow data, there is good correlation overall mm -hmm. with the invasive hemodynamic data. But I totally agree with Sumin. I mean, obstructive lesions, at least in different studies, will have, some of them will turn out to be not hemodynamically significant. A smaller proportion of what we call non-obstructive is turning out to be hemodynamically significant too, and this is based on initial FFR data. So what I would say, at least what I'm getting from those cases that go and get invasive hemodynamics is that there is good correlation more with the blood flow data. Uh, we're systematically looking at it. Ideally, we would like, there is one study with 200 patients where flow data and invasive hemodynamics, and it did correlate well. People are a little bit more skeptical of IFR, more accepting of FFR, so because it's kind of more physiologic rather than some modeling there or resting uh, pressure. So again, the gold standard is always a tricky point what to do for that. So that's something to keep in mind. So last case, I see you have clinical work to do, so Mahmoud. All right, um, so 48-year-old male, stent to LED circ and RCA, came in with chest pain, very typical, uh, radiating uh, to the left arm, neck, and jaw with high trope. All right, who's left here? Priyanka, you want to finish it, keeping the best to the last? <laughs> 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 okay, so stress is on top and rest is below that, right? Um, so I see a uh, in apical lateral, mid lateral, and I think basal lateral defect as well. Um, severity, I think it's moderate at least in the apical and mid lateral walls, and then maybe mild in the basal lateral. And I think it improves with rest. Um, defect size would be one, two, three, four. Yeah, moderate to large. A dodge, yeah. I can't read 67 it. to 60, drop. So there is an EF drop at peak. And, and there's, yeah, it kind of is the hypoperfused walls. Yeah, so the lateral wall is not contracting as it was doing here on stress. Sorry, on rest, on stress, it becomes hypokinetic. And then looking at flow data, um, the rest flows are normal, but globally, stress flows um, are decreased. Worst, uh, the MFR, I think, is worse in the circ territory, but it's low throughout. Yeah. So also, the other thing is that don't get into the trap of just looking at the MFR, because you can see the flow here was 0.76. So even at thrust, it was a little bit less, but the augmentation is way less here. So again, this patient does he have single vessel or multi vessel disease? So that's the biggest question. And if you look at the other territories, their flow reserve, their peak is a little bit better compared to the other. So probably it's going to be milder disease on the other territories rather than severe disease. So the present time has both stress and uh, Why don't you have? Flow. 
Yeah, part of it is, remember, your ejection fraction is also averaged over seven minutes. So some of this happened probably like it was worse in the beginning and less in the rest. So, but still, it, he probably has some element of like subendocardial scar that with spat spatial resolution, we cannot see it. I mean, there is tiny bit there, so there's probably some infarct there, part of the hypokinesis, and got worse there. He didn't have steel because most likely steals happen more with CTOs rather than, so he still have other, like, steel is much less of a phenomena, happens primarily with CTO, and most of the CTOs that do not have collateral. So if they have collaterals, you're less likely to see steel in there. So that's your answer. Is it CTO or not CTO? So here we see an apical caudal. Um, like uh, from the proximal segments, there are some stents, some calcifications, but nothing really major. Um, maybe in the mid LAD, there is some disease. What about the circ mid segment? And there. There. Play it. Can you play it? It's going in and out, covered by the other branch. So there's like a ramus as well up there that is going, uh, there's like a 99% occlusion, like proximal yeah. segment. Yeah. Um, the and there's some disease at one of the OMs at the branching point. And the diac too. RCA, at least on this view, there's like a CTO of the, oh no, actually, no, it's fine. Um, there's a stance that are patent. All right. Yeah, so it's primarily here, the ramus, diag, and maybe some disease in that one. All right. It's one o'clock. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mahmoud and Faisal.